branding or packaging, we'll see. Um, so next up is, is Kelly. Uh, Kelly is creative director and founder of White Bear. And she founded White Bear six years ago with the goal of creating creative and beautiful branding uh, with attitude, but most importantly, effective results. Uh, under her creative direction, we've grown uh, year on year and expanded across two countries. And her recent involvement with the Museum of Brands and Y Design has also positioned her as a key speaker uh, in conversations on creating an empowering workplace. Um, I'll leave Kelly to, uh, to do the rest. Over to you, Kelly. Hello, hoping everybody can hear me. <laughs> it's a bit of a funny mic thing going on. Uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, evening, actually, I guess. Um, thank you for some great spe speak or great talks we've had earlier on already. Um, Tessa, I can absolutely vouch for the rate of snacking going up, as has my waistline. Um, and Rachel and Flick, really, really interesting, um, interesting talks. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be making it a hat trick with a, another Japanese reference, um, but that doesn't mean I don't appreciate it. So I'm Kelly, the creative director and the founder of White Bear Studios. White Bear specialise in creating disruption for food and drink startups, scale-ups and big brands who need to step up to stay relevant. We help startups achieve investment. We help challengers, scale-ups build future-proof brands with those killer propositions. And we help the big guys adapt to the disruptive market uh, and launch new MPDs. This event, as I'm sure you know by now, is about bringing big brands together with small brands. And we want to, well, what I want to talk about in this talk is about challenger thinking um, and, and sharing that among big brands and small brands. I'm delighted to have such a wonderful mix of, of people in the, uh, in the, do you call it an audience? Uh, in the Zoom today is a real mix of big and small. Um, I'm sure you'll all agree, today's market is really fast moving and it's volatile. Uh, we've all felt it, COVID-19 has shaken up industries across the board. And no matter your company's size, your survival is at risk if you fail to disrupt, excite, and prove your innovative edge. So without further ado, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but I need to share my screen first. I'm aware that I have not done that. Okie dokie. So you should all be able to see my screen now. Um, Everyone is at risk of being hit from COVID-19 if we don't think quick, take measured risks and innovate. Uh, these traits may come naturally to startups, but larger brands uh, need to start learning or even unlearning fast if they want to keep up. Challenger brands are the Davids in this story, uh, not the Goliaths. They may be small, but they are extremely ambitious and there's a lot that we can learn from them. And successful ones will revolutionize industries. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about these five design top tips to build a disruptive brand and to think like a disruptor. So I'm talking more about the thinking and the creativity in this talk. These tips will take us through a brand building journey. Some of you may be more further along on your journey than others. So some tips may be more relevant to you, but I believe we can learn from each of them regardless. So without further ado, um, my first top tip to design to disrupt is to think brave. If your brand is brave enough to take risks and swim against the tide, you'll stand out. Are swimming in a sea of sameness. It takes a bravery to disrupt yourself with effective branding, not blending, and reiterating what Tessa said earlier on. This all starts with telling your brand's unique story and clearly communicating your value proposition with absolute clarity. If you're a well-established brand already, how do you build on that legacy and stay relevant? How do you approach building a fresh personality for a new MPD that needs to cut through that noise? As you can see here, your brand story runs through everything from inception to traction to when you scale into that big brand. And this all starts with your story. Think back to caveman times when storytelling was your currency and um, it made you memorable it gave you credibility and it demonstrated your bravery people remember stories not data as you can see there if you don't believe me jennifer also said it, a marketing professor from stanford um, 
So without, uh, I guess to demonstrate that, I'd like to tell you a little story. I don't know if any of you know Daniel Wegner or um, the white bear phenomenon. But essentially, Daniel Wegner was a Harvard professor. He studied thought suppression. And with all of his students, he asked them not to think about something. And that one thing that he asked them not to think about was a white bear. Whatever you do, just don't think about a white bear. I'd like you all just to take a few seconds now and stop what you're doing uh, and just don't think about a white bear. Think about something else. Maybe what you're going to have for dinner after this. Um, maybe did you brush your teeth this morning? But just do not think about a white bear. Just don't. Don't do it. Did you find that hard? Uh, well, lo and behold, Wagner found that whilst they tried their hardest to think about other things, his participants could not avoid, about, avoid thinking about a white bear for more than 20 seconds. The white bear phenomenon is a demonstration of the difficulty that people have in suppressing a thought. By trying not to think about something, we find we continuously think about this. Why am I telling you this story? Uh, well, for a number of reasons. Firstly, shameless plug for us, uh, first of the night, uh, we're called White Bear. Secondly, as this is what brands must do, they need to ensure that they stick in your mind. And thirdly, it's a key uh, piece to build any successful brand, is the ability to be memorable. What would you say your White Bear is? What is your story? You can't sell anything if you can't tell anything. A brand story is made up of five different components. Your purpose, your mission, your vision, your values, and how you communicate that through your tone of voice. And they form the basis of your story that you're gonna tell your customers. The brand story forms the foundation of that whole brand journey, right from inception and logo to the way you communicate on your packaging, to your point of sale, to your website, to your social, to every single touch point. It's really key that you know what your core narrative is. And of building that strong narrative will help you engage your target audience. First up, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about each of these a little bit. Um, but I'm sure a lot of you will agree that 90% of what goes on in your business happens behind the scenes. And it's that 10%. A brand story works much in the same way. The purpose, the mission, the vision, a lot of that is internal. And it's that, that value proposition on top, which summarizes what you do is you shout from the rooftops um, to all of your customers. 70% of all employees are misaligned with the company's strategic direction. Can you imagine how powerful it would be if 100% of employees were aligned with the purpose, mission and vision of the business? So let's start with purpose. Your purpose is your why. Why do you do what you do? Why, why are you needed? Knowing your purpose will help differentiate you from your competitors. It's an opportunity to clearly and, concise, and concisely let your potential stockist investors or customers know what the core of your business is. Next up, we have your vision. Your vision is, well, why do you get out of bed in the morning? This is more aspirational, uh, but it shows that you have a vision for the future. Be suitably ambiguous in this. Your vision needs to stand the test of time. Your product may change and pivot as the times do, but your vision should stay the same. Don't make it something that you can achieve within the next 10 years. A great example of this, and I, going back to, um, to nostalgia that I think um, Rachel talked about, I personally love this brand, uh, Tony's Chocoloni. Uh, it looks really fun, really appetizing, really tasty, but their wider vision is super aspirational. It's for 100% slave-free chocolate not just their own chocolate, but chocolate worldwide. And their vision is not something that they're going to achieve in the next 10 years. It's super aspirational. It might be that your vision is not for global change. Maybe it's a smaller vision than that. Maybe that you want to launch a beer, but your dream is to open a bar, open a brewery. Can't say the word brewery. Uh, neither can my brother-in-law, actually, anyway. Uh, make sure that your vision is suitably ambiguous for growth. Um, most people overestimate what they can do in one year, but underestimate what they can do in 10 years. Last, lastly, in making a really clear brand story is your mission. Your mission is potentially the easiest of the three to define. It's your strategy. It's how you're going to do it. 
I often say, if you picture your brand story as a journey, your purpose is why you set off on that journey. Your vision is that dream destination that you want to get to. And your mission is how you're going to get there. What are you going to do? When you have those three things, you now need to tell it in a compelling way. And we call this the value proposition. You may have a core value proposition for your brand and a number of sub propositions for MPDs. Um, but a value proposition summarizes your story in a sentence. A value proposition is a promise of value to be delivered, to be communicated and to be acknowledged bravely. A value proposition is an opportunity for you to be really brave in what you can deliver. Red Bull I have in here as example is a, a client of ours. Red Bull is a big brand that still demonstrates its bravery um, and its brand value proposition by inspiring courage in their customers. Red Bull always sponsoring record breaking and nerve breaking, nerve breaking, nerve wracking challenges even. Um, Red Bull makes you believe that you can have wings. Red Bull gives you wings and that's underpinned by their brand values. Here are a collection of some of their brand values. Another great example, another big brand is Burger King. Um, I'm sure we all remember being repulsed the first time we saw this Burger King ad, this moldy whopper. It was another really daring campaign. They showed confidence uh, in prove their point. Their value proposition, the beauty of no artificial preservatives, clearly demonstrates their move towards clean label ingredients and is communicated with bravery. They could have done this in a really safe way, but they did it with disruption. Their competitive spirit drives them to take risks. Um, and again and again, they see the benefits of that. So that's my first top tip is to think brave. My second one is to think like a future unicorn. Think about the future that you want. You need to develop a brand that stands out and can stand the test of time. A brand is much more than a name and a logo. It's, you know, that intangible feeling, that gut feeling you get nearly like when you meet a person and you're thinking, do I trust them? Do I like them? Do I want to hang out with them? A brand is much the same. It, it creates that gut feeling. How do you create a truly iconic brand that tells that compelling story and ensures that your product flies off the shelves? Well, there are three essential traits to building a future unicorn. Firstly, it's being ownable. Think about what makes you different, what makes you stand out. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Secondly, it's about telling that compelling story that I've talked a little bit about earlier, about what is that memorable story that you're going to tell? What's your white bear? And thirdly, it's about scalability. You need to build a brand that's future proof proofed for growth to allow you to pivot or change should you want to expand on products or move into a new area. First up, I'm going to talk a little bit about ownability. Um, ownability means that you have ownable assets unique to your story. And when we say assets, what I mean is a combination of a logo mark, logo tie, imagery, color palette, typography, tone of voice. Um, and most often in the food and drink world, it comes together in your packaging. I mean, it will exist social media, but if we're talking about a supermarket, having that shelf shout with all of those ownable assets is so important. And making sure that you get the hierarchy of those ownable assets is also really important. We often work to this 12 foot, six foot, one foot rule. From 12 foot back, you want brand impact. Six foot, you want to be able to see the skews and the flavors. And one foot, you want to be able to read about the benefits and features. So you have to make sure that all of it comes together to create something really ownable. Another little interesting thing is that when people view packaging, they look, they start with the left corner, top left corner of the pack, and they work their way down to the bottom right. So make sure that whatever is the most important, i.e. your brand, is right up there loud and proud. To demonstrate the importance of um, ownability, I have a few little tests that I think it would be fun to use the chat box for. Um, first up, I'm going to talk about each of these things, a unique logo, owning a color, bespoke topography, and having a consistent brand language. Unique logo, first up. Can anyone tell me who these brands are? They've no names on them now. They're a mix of big brands and challenger brands. Um, I can't actually see what anybody's saying. Um, maybe I can. Let me open the chat box. Does anyone know who these brands are? They are here. They are here. There. 
Okay. Um, let me, oh, I can't see the chat box. Um, I'm just going to guess that people are posting and saying that they know what they are. Um, but uh, so we have we have uh, Dunkin' Donuts, we have Bear, we have Starbucks, and we have Dorset. I'm guessing that you got them all right. And Bear are here. Oh, right. Welcome, Bear. Sorry, I have Dave telling me this across the room. Welcome. It's great to have you here. Um, you're in here as a great example. And next up, we have owning a colour. It's really difficult to own a colour in general, but it is possible to own a colour in your sector. So it's about getting to know your shelf, get to know your aisle, and get to know your competitive colours. Um, I have another little test here to demonstrate it. Um, for example, you might not know what colours these, these brands are associated with, but if I'm to tell you that they're social media apps, I'm guessing you'll be able to tell me what brands they are. Have a little stab at that. Pinterest. Yes, so, so I, I've thrown in a bit of a, a, a test one here on the end. So we have, we have our Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And what's interesting is we get YouTube, we get Meetup, we get Pinterest. So clearly those three guys aren't owning the brand color in their category. So they need to work a little bit harder. However, you'd instantly know Instagram from that gradient. How about food? Here are some food brand colors. These are all big guys, no challenge. Can you have a guess? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we haven't got the third one yet, I believe. Yeah. McDonald's, Dairy Milk, Heinz Beans. Interesting, now everyone would guess Heinz Beans, but now with Deliveroo, some people say Deliveroo, but actually they're a little bit of a different turquoise. Then bespoke topography is super important as well. Just using a typeface that you can download isn't good enough. It doesn't give you standout, it doesn't differentiate you, and it allows you to be really easily copied. So having bespoke crafted topography is super important. Anyone tell me these guys? I'm guessing we can. Calvin, not Calvin Klein, Burger King, um, Evian and Coca-Cola. Um, so you can see here, we haven't even written the name of the brand, but there's, uh, to be fair, this one's a bit of trickery because we have overlaid color in here as well, color and topography. And lastly, we have imagery. Anyone tell me the names of these brands? The one on the left, um, they have actually haven't changed the original illustrator since the 80s. Um, and they're just so iconic and instantly recognized in every one of their ad campaigns. So we have um, Red Bull and we have Tommy Hilfiger. And last up, we have Tone of Voice. Again, your value proposition. How do you communicate in the right tone to speak to your right target audience? I'm going to talk a little bit about Tone of Voice again in a minute. Um, but can anyone tell me who these guys are? Yeah, we have yeah, Nike, we have Apple. L'Oreal, and we have KFC. So yeah, well done. So owning a, owning a, a unique logo, owning a color, bespoke topography, and consistent brand language is super important. So that is ownability. Second up is memorability. Memorability. Having a clear brand story will help you to be memorable. Remember, our consumers remember stories, not data. Being memorable will build your customer loyalty and make it easier for you to track your brand's valuation. This may seem obvious, but it's a crucial part in building um, a brand um, and, and to get your customers to keep coming back. We often say, us as an agency, it's our job to get somebody to buy your product once, but it's your job to get them to keep coming back. Especially if you're a challenger and some of those big brands are out there trying to replicate your products, being memorable is super important. Another way of being memorable is having iconic uh, an iconic packaging shape. Can anybody tell me some of the names of these brands? Their, their bottles or their jars in forever and they're iconic and are really important IP to the brand. Yeah, we've got the answers coming in here. Yeah, uh, so we have, yeah, 
ketchup, ketchup, Tabasco, Coke, Pringles, um, Orangina, Marmite, um, toilet duck, sexy toilet duck. And then last up, we have scalable. Taking time to think about your story will help you scale. Remember your vision and being suitably ambiguous. You need a future proof. You need to future proof your brand so you don't pin yourself down by having a name or an identity that confines you to just one thing. You need to have a name and a brand that's able for you to flex. So to recap, ownable, memorable, and scalable is the right recipe to get a really iconic and um, future-proofed brand. I'm a, a brand that I'm sure you all will agree has these three elements in the bucket loads is ugly. Um, I'm sure Joe will be smiling to know that we're talking about this. Uh, ugly chose a very ownable name to disrupt the sector. Most other fruit related drinks use prettier words like an innocent or an Evian, not ugly. For this same reason, their name is, is memorable. The word ugly stands out and it creates intrigue. You want to find out why aren't they so ugly? Their tone of voice also follows suit, using phrases like contains no unattainable lifestyles, plays on that relatable social norms uh, in our current climate that, that we're so used to. The Ugly Band have created a really playful brand uh, world that is allow will allow them to grow. Their cheeky brand will bring attitude to wherever they choose to go in the future. That brings me to my third point. Think disruptive. No, sorry, I read that wrong. Think transparent. All of these are teaching you how to think disruptively. Uh, be emotive in your branding uh, and your marketing campaign. People connect strongly to stories because we're such emotional beings. So tap into this. A good place to always start is with your brand values. MRI neuroimagery shows that when evaluating brands, consumers primarily use emotions. So while benefits and features are super, super important, it's the intangible emotion that's going to grab people. Millennial, millennials and Gen Zs want to engage and feel that their values are aligned with the brands they use. Although brands don't do need to be careful with jumping on political bandwagons, as I'm sure you'll all agree Pepsi found out the hard way. Not practicing what they preach. Uh, you need to be simple, be genuine, and show people what you stand for. 68% of Gen Zs are concerned about the environment. And 61% of Gen Zs believe that um, brands are in a better position to solve government then governments solve social problems. So if Gen Z uh, are your target audience, you really need to make sure that you're listening to them. So let's talk a little bit about brand values. Your brand values are your brand's heartbeat. You need to live or die by them. It's important that you know what these are. Believe it or not, many businesses' brand values don't actually align with core beliefs and tend to kind of sit there as a bit of a tick box exercise and left to gather dust. dust. I'm sick to death of hearing people cite integrity, empathy, and quality as core brand values. These aren't standouts. These should be um, a given and not a differentiator. There's an opportunity here for you to be really different with your brand values. Be authentic. Being authentic is really, really important. So we always do this little exercise when we run our workshops uh, to get the juices flowing. And I would also say if you already have brand values and you are one of those bigger brands, thinking about how you can take your current brand values and use them in a really fresh way is a great way um, of building, building campaigns and building brand awareness. To get the juices flowing, uh, it'd be great for some people to pop the answers to some of these in the chat box. Uh, we always do these with our workshops. Um, if your product was an animal, what animal would you I think that we're really, really interested in here? The why gives us an insight into who your brand is and what it stands for. For example, am I brave because I'm a lion? Um, does anybody have any answers as to what animals they might be? Giraffe. A giraffe, interesting. <laughs> uh, if your product was a genre of music, what genre of music would it be? This is a really good one because it gives us an insight into the feeling of your business. Are you hip hop? Are you classical? It also gives you a feel for how you might write your copy and how you want people to feel when they see your brand. It'll build that personality. 
with when we've done this, these workshops with some of our clients, we often find they go away and make a Spotify playlist for their brand and they put it on when they really want to get in that right mindset. If people believe that they share values with the company, they'll stay loyal to that brand. An example here of um, bad brand values, which reminds me of good idea, bad idea. If anyone is an Animaniacs fan out there. Um, the Mass Brothers fooled the world into paying $10 for a bar of hipster chocolate. They were founded on values of authenticity and they said they were bean to bar when in fact they originally used remelted mass produced chocolate. These guys chose to shout about values that actually didn't align with their core business. People sniffed out um, this, uh, how disingenuous they were. And people cop onto this really quick. So you need to be what you believe in. An example of good values, on the other hand, is Oakley. I'm sure many of you will agree. Well, for me anyway, this was such a memorable ad and probably the last one I remember seeing in the real world uh, pre-lockdown. Um, Oatly is a great example of a brand that has aligned values across every page of their website, their packaging, their ad campaigns. They believe in being totally honest and transparent. Their recent uh, self-conscious tube ads stuck to this uh, and were really, really memorable. I loved these. This brings me to my fourth um, design to disrupt. I think challenger brands are awesome at this at the minute. However, the big guys could probably do with working on it a little bit more. Um, because challenger brands are often dealing with small budgets, they're inspired to think fast and act create creatively. You can't outspend the big brands, you need to outfox them. Startups have an entrepreneurial spirit at their core. Each team member feels as though they own the business and it's on them to scale it and make the company famous. They'll take risks, they'll test new ideas, their flexibility in production and design allows them to identify new trends and to respond a lot quicker. Larger brands may find this more difficult. I've been through this process myself with some of the bigger brands that we work with. They get bogged down in design by committee. Um, you need to get a lot of stakeholder buy-in. I know it can be really hard and this is something that do, does need to be addressed. But it's also worth noting that creativity and a really great idea doesn't cost a fortune. So to think like a challenger, marketeers need to communicate with their audience quickly in order to test out their novel ideas and pivot as quickly as possible. Something to consider when thinking fast and creatively is your tone of voice here. Your tone of voice should come into absolutely everything that you do. You can plot your tone of voice on this barometer that we, that we use. Barometer shows the four pillars of tone of voice from humor to formality, respectfulness to enthusiasm. It's a really good starting place for plotting your tone of voice and making sure that everything that you do aligns with it. A great example is, I mean, if you like your tea strong, Yorkshire tea have, let's have a proper brew, as well as the problem they're solving and the product that they're selling. They've brought in their Yorkshire heritage there through their tone of voice. Another great example is Brewdog who I wouldn't say are a challenger anymore. They're, they're now becoming the big guys. Um, but Brewdog's lockdown um, campaign had so many media impressions. They were so high that they outfoxed the more established brands with next to no ad spend, just super creativity and speed and responsiveness. They used their signature provocative tone of voice here. It was the most amount actually crashed their website for nine hours. It also enabled them to make uh, 100,000 bottles of hand sanitizer to help during the pandemic. As I said, they're not really challengers anymore, but I feel like they still empower the challenger brand thinking. And again, my favorite, the Burger Kings, uh, a great big brand who show how quick and responsive they can be. I just saw this the other day. I thought it was awesome. They're an example of a big brand who responded to COVID-19 really quickly. They recently announced that they would be delivering mini pride parades to anyone that ordered a takeaway meal in Spain after hearing that Spain's pride celebrations would not be going ahead after nearly 60 years. It's just such a great idea. Now to my fifth top tip, think tribal. Create brands that people want to be part of. Challenger brands build communities, not customers. 
online communities are one of the major factors that set challenger brands apart. Now, more than ever, people want to engage in bigger causes. They want to feel that they're kept part of building uh, their favorite brands. They want to have an authentic dialogue and they really want to be listened to by their brands. If you're really curious about this, I would recommend a hundred times, uh, a million times, Ben Keen's five R's for tribe building. Ben Keen's a co-founder of the Rebel Book Club and Tribe Wanted, and he's the best tribe builder we know. He sort of webinar with us uh, maybe last month, so I'd really recommend checking that out. A great example of tribe building are Huel. Again, a really good example of D2C. Um, the Huel community is for people who value nutrition, simplicity, and sustainability. Their online form gives people the opportunity to share their thoughts, ask questions, and feel heard by their brand. If people are in it together, it's easy to, to uh, complete our goals. They've created a tribe for real fans who believe in the company's mission, plant-based, minimal waste, lower carbon footprint, and no animal products. They've also created some sweet merch, uh, like branded bottles and shirts. Uh, I'm surprised Dave's not wearing one today. Um, and it's a tribe identifier. When you bring in one of these to the office, one of those bottles, you can quickly look across the, the office floor and see if anybody else has got the Hue hype bug too. And that feeling of being part of something is super important nowadays when building a brand. So those essentially are my five top tips for design for disruption. It's about thinking like a challenger. And what you need to do is to recap, you need to think brave, you need to think transparent, think fast and creative, and think community. And the most important of all is think like that future unicorn that you're going to become. And once you reach that unicorn status, just don't go stale. Stay relevant and stay exciting to your customers and surprise them with creativity. Um, so that's, yeah, I guess that's essentially my talk. Um, time for the shameless plug again here. Uh, I'm offering uh, brand brainstorm sessions to everyone here. They are free. Um, visit our website or DM me to book one or email Audrey. Um, and another thing, actually, if you're not part of our future unicorn Slack group um, and community, I'd welcome you all with open arms. Uh, it's a really great space to, for creative brands. So next up is our headliner, but yeah, that's all for me.